What's going on on my YouTube buddies? I'm Jacob and welcome to my Cinema Roundup of July 2022. Didn't have one in June. Had some things come up in my schedule, but I'm back in July showing all the movies I watched in theaters and streaming in July. Let's get started with the video. We are the same, you and I. We are two odd lonely children reaching for eternity. The greatest show on earth. So the first movie that I watched in July is Elvis. I just got out of seeing it in the theaters. Elvis is the newest music biopic, which I think has kind of become a genre now at this point. As I've had quite a few of them in the, quite a few years, like you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, Judy, Rocket Man, Respect, just to name a few. And Elvis is the newest one in this trend of movies. Elvis is directed by Baz Luhrmann, the same guy behind such films as Moulin Rouge and Romeo and Juliet, that weird one from the 90s with DiCaprio. Never been a fan of that one. But Moulin Rouge has slowly become one of my favorite musicals of all time. I was kind of in on it when I first watched it, but I've slowly grown to love that movie. And I love the soundtrack of that movie. Check out Moulin Rouge if you haven't seen it already. Elvis, obviously we all know who Elvis Presley is. One of the greatest, greatest artists in music history. The king of rock and roll. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Austin Butler who plays Elvis in this movie. I have not been that familiar with Austin Butler. Apparently he did some Nickelodeon roles. And I know he had a supporting role in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but I didn't really pay attention to him the one time I saw that movie. And uh, he's phenomenal in this movie. Believe the hype. He did an amazing job at bringing Elvis to life. Like the mannerisms, the voice, the hip shaking, everything you love about Elvis is reflected in Austin Butler. And where it was one of those times where I just I didn't see the actor. I saw. The purse, I saw the person on screen, uh, kind of like how I felt when I saw Walking Phoenix play Johnny Cash and walk the line. It was that magnificent of a performance. And Austin Butler nailed it off. He got the singing down, he got the voice down. It was an incredible performance. And I hope that the Academy gives him the Oscar buzz. I was bummed that they didn't give it to Taron Edgerton when he played Elton John several years ago because that was a fantastic performance too. But I'm glad Austin Butler's getting all the love in the world. And I'm glad that Baz chose Austin to play Elvis because I saw some of the other actors that were in consideration. Yeah, Miles Teller is a good actor. Yeah, Ansel Elgort's a good actor who sang well in West Side Story. But I can't picture either of them singing or playing Elvis Presley. So they picked a good actor to fill in that role with Austin Butler. I do I did enjoy Baz's direction. His signature flashy style hyper editing actually does really work. And I liked the structure that he provided the movie. Yes, the movie's long, it's like two and a half hours, but I felt like that runtime was needed because Elvis had such an interesting career in the span of two decades in his uh, pretty unfortunately short life and I, I enjoyed the general flow of the story I was a little bit surprised at some of the direction that it did take because I because I was I grew up loving Elvis as a kid I love some of his songs and his music and I knew about some of the history uh, especially some of the clashes he had with his manager Colonel Tom Parker but I didn't know like the full extent of that and the movie I thought did a good job of showing that Colonel Tom was a sleaze and a scumbag and pretty much a phony throughout his whole life and I think the movie did a good job of showing that it was a little weird though because 
Colonel Tom is the one narrating the story, but he's like the unreliable narrator because we know he's the scum, but Colonel thinks he's the good guy while he's narrating, which to me that was kind of weird because the movie was trying to paint that he was kind of sort of responsible for Elvis's death. And so it was kind of weird that the movie did that, but it was still a really interesting little structure that fit with the wacky, flamboyant style of Baz's direction. And the movie had a really good pace to it. Even with its extended runtime, I was invested in the story and it got pretty emotional at times. You may be wondering, Jacob, you talked about Austin Butler. You thought he was great. What about Tom Hanks? How did he do as Colonel Tom? Well, I'm kind of 50-50 on him. I thought Tom Hanks gave it his all like he always does. I mean, he's my favorite actor of all time, so obviously he's gonna commit to this movie. And I can't say he was horrible in the movie. He embraced the character, but unlike Austin Butler, you know, Austin Butler transformed into Elvis, and I thought I was seeing Elvis on screen. I didn't feel that with Tom Hanks. I just saw Tom Hanks in a fat suit playing a cartoonish caricature. I think if the movie really wanted to show how despicable the guy was, I think the movie should have cast either an unknown or not, or maybe maybe a seasoned actor, but one that doesn't have the big caliber that Tom Hanks has. Because you know, I just saw Tom Hanks in the movie by the end of the day instead of. Colonel Tom Parker and I guess that was where my frustration lied in the performance because all the other actors transformed into the real life figures. I didn't feel that with Tom Hanks. I just saw an exaggerated performance. Doesn't hurt my enjoyment of the movie though. I think Elvis is a great movie. If you're like me who's been a fan of Elvis since childhood, this is as good of an Elvis biopic as you can get because it does a good job of telling Elvis's life story from beginning to end, uh, the behind the scenes drama, the clashes with Colonel Tom, and all the incredible music that he brought along the way, and the mesmerizing, incredible performances uh, throughout the two decades that he brought as an entertainer. And this movie does a good job of celebrating Elvis, the myth, the legend, and the legacy of such an incredible artist. And so, this is as good of an Elvis biopic as you can get. Yeah, Tom Hanks is a little too over the top in this movie, and some of the choices I'm not the biggest fan of, like there's weird hip hop remixes of Elvis songs in this movie that fell out of place, but at the end of the day, it's a great movie. I do highly recommend checking this one out, especially if you're an Elvis fan, and at the end of the day, I'll be giving Elvis a four and a half out of five stars, and on the 100 point scale, it's getting an 84 out of 100. You be a hero and still be wrong. The ocean has sent us its worst, then we'll send it right back. The Sea Beast is the newest animated film you can stream on Netflix. This movie was directed by Chris Williams, who previously worked at Disney Animation, having co-directed films such as Bolt and Moana. And now he moved over to Netflix and directed his first film as a solo director with The Sea Beast. And this movie is a very fascinating story. We follow these group of hunter characters who go out on the high seas and they hunt down these sea monsters and uh, their quest ends up taking them uh, against this big red beast and we follow uh, one of the crew members who along with a little stowaway child uh, they get separated from the main event and they learn more about the history of the sea beast the big battle between man and beast uncover a little bit of a conspiracy growing about that, and then they have to you know, figure out what to do after that, after finding out the truth of what's going on. And this is a movie that I saw advertised on YouTube several times, and 
And this was a movie I saw advertised several times on YouTube. Some of the ads that pop up when watching some of the monetized videos on the platform. And when I was doing the July preview for the Life in the Movies podcast over on Ryan Cam's channel, this was one of my most anticipated movies of the month of July because this movie looks so fascinating and Netflix has done some great things in the world of animation. I mean check out movies like Klaus and Over the Moon if you want proof of that. And so I was really excited to see this. The movie did not disappoint. There's incredible animation in this movie. The whole world and environment felt so lived in in this movie and I really appreciated some of the finer details of the visual aesthetic. The movie is actually two hours long, which is a little lengthy in animation standards, but the runtime I felt was awesome and justified to flesh out this world to give us really amazing action sequences that had me on the edge of my seat several times. Some of these battles between the human characters and some of the sea creatures was actually very, very well done. And I have to highly commend Chris Williams for that. Probably helped that he was one of the directors of Moana. So that was kind of like his audition tape for this movie. And now that he's on his own, he did a great job of doing awesome sea battles. And it was really incredible to see. A really strong voice cast as well. Our main character is voiced by Carl Urban, which I thought was an amazing touch. I thought his character, Jacob Holland, was a very enjoyable character. You definitely see where he's coming from. He's raised on the sea. So he has a vendetta against sea monsters because he was an orphan and uh, the people that he originally loved were killed at such a young age. And so he's raised to go against these sea monsters pretty much. And then you have the younger uh, girl character, Maisie, who, who's orphaned as well and st stows away on the ship and learning, about, and learning more about these sea creatures along the way. And is the one that kind of has to like bridge the gap between the viewpoints of the characters. Uh, this movie does a good job of having characters that have uh, different motivations and viewpoints. Yet, you definitely see where they're coming from. I, I don't think any main character in this movie is a villain per se. Because they are raised to believe what they do believe. And they're set in their ways. Even though some of the things they're doing may not be 100% right at the end of the day, you definitely see where everybody's coming from, and it all pays off in the big conclusion at the end on how they resolve this matter between the whole feud between the hunters and the sea beasts is actually done pretty, pretty well, even if the message can come off a bit heavy-handed at times. I will admit that. Like, the final speech is borderline preachy, but... I thought it still fit within the overall story, and I still enjoyed the movie for what it was. I guess that's the only like real negative I have with this movie. That and the fact that the story can get a little predictable at times. Like Once I saw our opening scene involved in an action scene between Hunters and Sea Beasts, I'm like, yeah, I think I kind of know where the story's going to go, because uh, the story is kind of similar in a lot of ways to How to Train Your Dragon a little bit, if you've seen How to Train Your Dragon, and how that movie dealt with like the relationship between man and beast. You've probably seen the general plot of this story, but it's still a good story. I do like the characters, especially uh, the main character, uh, the little girl that they who bond together in this movie. Are a pretty good little duo, actually, especially Maisie. She could have derailed this movie because it's a child character. But she definitely held her own. I liked how determined she was. Uh, a little bit funny at times. And I actually did enjoy uh, seeing these two characters grow together. It was actually really cool to see. And I especially enjoyed the bond between the Jacob character and the captain. Who's I like his father figure in a way. He's the one that took him in. And they have a really complicated relationship as well. And I like where that grows throughout the course of the story. So there's a lot that I do really enjoy in this movie. I, with the only thing kind of holding it back is, even though I appreciate that this is a, definitely a more mature story in the world of animation, it's a little rough around the edges at times, especially how violent the film can be. 
but it's still a great family watch and I love that Netflix gave the green light to make a story like this because it's epic in every sense of the word though not perfect it's still a highly enjoyable animated feature I think there's better animated movies that have come out this year like I think to date my favorite animated film I've seen is still the bad guys but this is still highly enjoyable I don't think the movie's getting near as much attention and I gotta say Netflix and their animated departments not doing too hot right now Netflix lost a lot of money earlier this year and they laid off a good chunk of their animated department so you gotta give this movie some love so that more movies can be made like this over at Netflix this is a great movie Chris Williams I think is an underrated talent in the art of animation I especially love what he brought in Moana and it's no exception here in The Sea Beast I thought he did a really great job with this movie really really good stuff great animation very complex characters awesome action sequences and visuals very well done story and at the end of the day I'll be giving the Sea Beast a four and a half out of five stars and on the 100 point scale it's getting an 82 out of 100. Just look into the eyes of the people that you love. Not me. What? Just listening. Thor Love and Thunder is the latest movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the fourth film in the Thor franchise. Fun fact, Thor is the first MCU character to have more than three films in the MCU. So that's a really good record there, Marvel. Taika Waititi once again directed this movie following the success of Thor Ragnarok. And this movie follows Thor going on another adventure, teaming up with Valkyrie and Jane Foster, who dons the mighty Thor, or the lady Thor, and they team up to take on the villainous Gore, the God Butcher, played by Christian Bale. So I was excited to see this movie when it was first announced, especially with Taika coming back to direct. I will admit I was skeptical on the whole Lady Thor aspect of the movie. Like I like Natalie Portman, but Jane Foster hadn't been the most interesting character in the previous Thor movies, especially after The Dark World. So I wasn't sure how they were going to pull that off. But I love Taika Waititi's style and flair. Ragnarok is one of my favorite movies in the MCU. So I was excited to check out another Taika-directed Thor movie. Then I got a little hesitant going into the theater because I saw some of the reactions to this movie. I saw a lot of people online weren't liking this movie. Some people thought it felt more like a spoof Thor movie over an actual Thor movie. Some people were like... Taika's humor was way too far, and it derailed the movie. And I think I saw somebody say this was the Batman and Robin of the MCU. I'm like, oh, I'm a little nervous, but I'm kind of intrigued, because this could be a So Bad as Good movie we're talking about here. I do have opinions on this movie, and it's weird. I'll, I'll do as best of an opinion as possible without going into spoilers, because the Cinema Roundup videos are supposed to be spoiler-free. I thought this movie was perfectly fine. There's lackluster stuff in it, and it's a huge step down from Thor Ragnarok. But I don't think this film is a travesty. I think this film is fine for what it is. I mean, it's Taika Waititi. He does what he does best as a visual director. Uh, there's a lot of great jokes sprinkled throughout the movie. It's visually wonderful to look at. And the performances are all really good in this movie. Chris Hemsworth is still awesome as Thor. He's still plays for like he always does still has that sprinkle of humor and goofiness in him like he had in Ragnarok uh, Tessa Thompson though very underused in this movie compared to in Ragnarok is still enjoyable as Valkyrie the Guardians of the Galaxy are also in this movie they're pretty much only in an extended bit in the opening scene that's not a spoiler I think that's kinda obvious they wouldn't be in the movie that much but when they are on screen the movie was a lot of fun and I can't wait to see Guardians 3 coming out next year I will say Natalie Portman surprised me I actually was fine with her addition in the movie as Lady Thor the aspect that I was skeptical on the most 
She was serviceable. Now, I do have issues with where they build up her as Thor. I wish they needed a lot more work, but her in the role of the Thor mantle was a lot of fun. I actually did enjoy the back and forth chemistry with her and Chris Hemsworth. The movie does play out like a rom-com in the MCU when the two are on screen. And I think of the actors and their chemistry, this is the one where you get to see their chemistry shine the best. And I think it improves the first movie in a lot of regards because of uh, where the first movie originally took their story. It's intensified more in this movie. And I actually appreciate where Taika took these characters. And then we got Gore the God Butcher played by Christian Bale who is absolutely excellent. Another amazing villain in the MCU. Again, I wish we had more of him in the film, but Christian Bale did leave a memorable impression. Very scary, formidable foe for Thor to take on. And I really liked Gore's character journey as well, although I wish we got more of him. Going into my negatives, though, I see where the haters are coming from because the movie feels like two movies at arm's length. You have the stuff with Gore killing a bunch of gods because he wants to destroy all the gods because of you know what happened with him. I, it's too much of a spoiler I don't want to get into. And we got the whole Thor stuff and Thor and Jane and Valkyrie going on their little adventure. And they go have some goofy shenanigans along the way. Like there's an extended bit in the middle act where they're hanging out with Zeus played by Russell Crowe. Which a lot of people did not like the Russell Crowe as Zeus from what I saw, but... I actually thought the Zeus stuff was some of the funniest stuff in the movie, but that's just me personally. I actually thought that scene was pretty hilarious. But my issue is there's it looks like there's two movies at arm's length from each other. And even um, you have the silly aspects of this movie, which I feel like Taika intensifies in this movie, doubles down upon the camp value. Yet the serious weightiness that he adds in the story, which I would say is more weight even in Ragnarok, as we got... Gore doing his stuff, and then even the whole backstory for how Jane becomes Thor is deeped in sadness. I'm not diving into that because it's not in the trailers. They're kind of at arm's length from each other because the goofiness and some of the serious stuff, especially in this movie, just don't mesh well. Especially, which is sad, because Ragnarok had that tonal, weird tonal shifts in the movie, yet... Ragnarok worked as a movie because they were perfectly timed together. Whereas I don't feel like it's as timed as well in Love and Thunder when you have especially Jane's story, Gore's story mixed with Thor joking with the Guardians and Thor hanging out with Zeus. And if you've seen the stuff with Zeus, you know where that goes. And there's stuff with screaming goats and other ridiculous stuff that happens in this movie and just... The pieces aren't always put together in this movie compared to what we got in Thor Ragnarok. And also, I think the movie could have fleshed out some of its characters a lot more. Like, I think if Gore was better fleshed out and Jane Foster was better fleshed out, especially how she becomes Thor, it would make the final payoff more rewarding. I do like where the story ends, uh, especially where it builds Thor as a character in this movie, but... It does come off a little bit hollow, I'm not going to lie, because of how weird the tones were weirdly mixed in this movie. It's just the seriousness in this movie and the jokey stuff in this movie just aren't compatible in this movie compared to how well it was better balanced in Thor Ragnarok. And there's just like some absolutely dumb stuff in this movie that really took me out of it. There's this one action scene in the third act, I'm not going to dive into it because of spoilers, but... It took me out of the movie. It's literally one of the stupidest things I've ever seen in an MCU movie. And honestly, I felt like I was watching some of Robert Rodriguez's family films over something in the MCU. And eh, I don't know how I feel about the Thor movies going forward. That's all I'll say about that. But I think it's an average Thor movie. I do think it's better than The Dark World if I had to rate the Thor movies, but... The movie does make me appreciate the first Thor a lot more because I do like the weighty origin story of Thor. And Ragnarok I appreciate more because Taika did a great job of balancing tones in that movie and having such a ridiculously entertaining time. Love and Thunder has some fun stuff in there. I do enjoy this movie for what it is. I do like individual parts of this movie awfully well. 
But the movie is very tonally imbalanced, and it took me out of some of the emotional stakes and the emotional highs that the movie was trying to go for. It took a few risks, but I don't think this movie paid off near as well as what Ragnarok did. So, unfortunately, Thor Love and Thunder, though I don't hate it, it's definitely one of the weaker MCU films. Though it's definitely a more watchable, entertaining film than Thor The Dark World, but definitely nowhere near as awesome as what Thor Ragnarok was, unfortunately. So for me, I'll be giving Thor Love and Thunder a 3.5 out of 5 stars, and on the 100 point scale, it's getting a 66 out of 100. In 3, Grandma always said she believed in you. 2, 1. There was a big swirly do. Oh, I think I need a bag. No, no. Please record your last words. Do not vomit inside the vehicle. Do not vomit inside the vehicle. If you are satisfied with this recording, speak or select uh. 1. Lightyear is the newest film from Pixar. I finally got to see this film. I checked it out at my local dollar theater. And this movie, there was a lot of confusion about this movie, what this movie actually was ever since the concept of Lightyear was first announced. But they do explain it when you watch the actual movie. So Lightyear is actually the movie that Andy watched, the movie that came out in 1995 that featured the Buzz Lightyear character and he loved the movie so much that he wanted the Buzz Lightyear toy and the toy was what inspired was and the toy was the product from the Buzz Lightyear movie pretty simple concept so this is the Buzz Lightyear story uh, Buzz Lightyear the Space Ranger he and his crew crash land on a planet uh, because of a certain mistake that Buzz Lightyear makes early on in the course of the movie and Buzz is determined to get off of this planet pretty much but you know there's this hyperspace type stuff and he's losing the people he loves and so there's a new generation of crew that ultimately ends up teaming up with Buzz Lightyear while the evil Emperor Zerg and his army of robots are also invading this planet and they have to you know, figure out how to get off this planet while also facing a new threat at the same time. That's the pretty simple premise of Lightyear without diving into any spoilers. Lightyear fascinates me. I was so hyped to see this movie because I'm such a big Pixar fan. The Toy Story franchise is phenomenal. Buzz Lightyear is a great character. And I was looking forward to seeing this movie. But then some of the reviews kept pouring in. Some people really didn't like this movie. Others really loved this movie. There was a controversy centering around the film. Some people were upset that, you know, Tim Allen did not reprise his role as Buzz Lightyear and we got Chris Evans instead. There was some other controversy regarding a certain kiss involving two characters that, you know, some people didn't like that. But I honestly, I, I was willing to give this movie an open mind and check the movie out for myself and honestly this movie is fine I don't think this is top tier Pixar or anything it doesn't strive the highs of the Toy Story franchise but the movie we got is an entertaining sci-fi adventure from beginning to end I thought the space adventure stuff was a load of fun Buzz Lightyear was a likable character who was willing to do his job, but also learning to overcome his own flaws as a person along the way. The side characters were a load of fun, and even the controversy centered around the movie, I feel like were blown out of proportion. Like, the kiss, for example, was just one second. It was in the background, and I don't think it'll do any damage to any kids watching the movie, and that's coming from somebody in the Christian group. That was blown way out of proportion, in my opinion. I will say it is disappointing that Tim Allen did not get to play Buzz Lightyear in this movie. Considering Tim Allen pretty much has the voice of Buzz Lightyear that I come to know and love, I think it was perfect to have him play Buzz Lightyear in this movie, but that unfortunately didn't happen. Chris Evans is fine. like He fits into the role pretty good, even though... Sometimes it feels like he's Captain America instead of Buzz Lightyear when you know you hear his voice, but I think he fits into the Buzz Lightyear character 
fine enough, but I can definitely see why Chris Evans could be a turnoff for some people because Tim Allen has just embodied the Buzz Lightyear character for so long. And yeah, it is disappointing that he did not get to play Buzz Lightyear in this movie, the human form version of Buzz Lightyear that inspired the Buzz Lightyear toy. That would have been awesome. There is one aspect of the movie where it feels like there was a role perfectly suited for Tim Allen to play. But, you know, that didn't happen, and that was a big wasted opportunity. I will say what holds this movie back, honestly, is the film feels too safe. I think, yeah, you know, there are some emotional highs in this movie, especially in Buzz Lightyear's character growth and some of the sacrifices that he makes along the way in his journey. But the overall adventure just can feel a little bit routine at times. It's a tried-and-true sci-fi formula that we've seen in various different other sci-fi fantasy adventure movies. Like, there's a dash of Star Wars in here. There's a dash of Interstellar in here and Star Trek, among other things. This uh, definitely feels conventional in a lot of regards. And so the main adventure is nothing like anything crazy, amazing to write home about. I will say the supporting characters are nowhere near as interesting as Buzz Lightyear himself. I enjoyed a couple of the characters, like Socks the kitten robot was actually really enjoyable like he had some of the best laughs in the entire movie but some of the other uh space characters in the movie that hang out with buzz are not really that interesting of characters uh taika watiti plays a character who just fell out of place in this entire movie i have nothing against taika he's a funny guy but for some reason, this comedy wasn't doing it for me in this movie. A part of me thinks he might be losing his touch because Thor Love and Thunder definitely was not near as funny as Thor Ragnarok, but I don't know. I still like the guy, and for some, some reason, he didn't fit in this movie. I know some people didn't care for how they handled Zerg in this movie. I didn't know anything about what they did to Zerg until I saw the movie in theaters, but for me... The Zerg stuff I thought was actually pretty brilliant. I'm not going to dive into it because of spoilers. It does kind of subvert expectations a little bit, but considering what they were building with Buzz as a character, I actually thought it worked really well, and I actually enjoyed the interaction between the two characters and how that kind of connects with the history of the characters that were all, was already established in within the Toy Story movies themselves. So, while this isn't like top tier Pixar or anything, I do think this movie plays it safe in a lot of regards. Not all the humor lands for me, but it's still a fun little sci-fi adventure. I bet if I was 8, 10 years old when this movie came out, I would have loved it. I think this movie, I think, is meant for younger audiences who probably haven't seen any of the many sci-fi movies that you or I have watched, all the many classics and the great sci-fi we're getting today. This, I think, is meant as a gateway for kids, I feel like. And this movie, I think, executed it very, very well for the younger demographic. And I think it's an enjoyable adventure that I think kids that grow up watching this movie are going to love it. And it's going to become a cult classic. It's a shame that this movie's underperformed. I don't think this is the best Pixar movie or anything, but... I think it delivered in what it set out to do, and even though I would consider this like mid-tier Pixar in my opinion, the fact that Pixar still crafts so many incredible movies each year, you know, you can still have a enjoyable enough Pixar movie, and it still be alright with me, considering they've done Toy Story and The Incredibles and Finding Nemo and Up and so many other remarkable classics. I think Pixar can get away with doing just a good enough Pixar movie once in a while. I still expect more from Pixar, of course. I actually thought Turning Red was a much better movie, in my opinion, that was a lot more emotional and entertaining than Lightyear, but Lightyear is still an enjoyable movie, and I definitely recommend it, especially if you're a hardcore Pixar fan, or if you have younger kids, this would be a good gateway to sci-fi adventures. This movie is a lot of fun, and I'll be giving Lightyear a 4 out of 5 stars. And on the 100 point scale, it's getting a 74 out of 100. I can kill anybody. Maybe not anybody.
The Gray Man is the latest Netflix action movie. This film was actually directed by the Russo brothers. Yes, those Russo brothers, known for four of the best MCU movies. They previously directed Captain America the Winter Soldier, Captain America Civil War, and Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And so they're now that they've completed their MCU works and are trying to do different things, they got the job directing The Gray Man on Netflix, and this movie stars Ryan Gosling as the Gray Man, who's like this secret assassin who does secret assassinations for the CIA. Ana de Armas is in this movie, and our big bad guy is played by Chris Evans with a ridiculously over-the-top mustache. The literal mustache whirly villain. I was excited to see this movie when it was first announced. I want to see the Russos succeed after directing some of the best Marvel movies, especially after the big highs of both Infinity War and Endgame. And when the trailer dropped, I was very much hyped to see this film. The action looked incredible. I loved the cast that they got. And, you know, considering Netflix spent so much money on this film, it was one of their most expensive films yet. I think partly because of the cast hiring the Russo brothers and the big scope and scale of this film. Yeah, I was expecting this to be a great smash for Netflix. So why is this film disappointing? Well, going into my pauses first before I get into why I don't care for this movie. The action sequences are well done. The Russo brothers bring the same bag of tricks they brought to their MCU films in The Gray Man. The movie's trying to go for that espionage thriller route, spy thriller route, kind of like what they did with The Winter Soldier. And action-wise, they succeeded a little bit at that. The action scenes were all well done, I thought. There's some good fist fights. There's some good chase sequences. It's a well-done movie on an action level, and the action sequences, I thought, were pretty well handled. And of all the performances in this movie, the one that stood out the most, I would say, is Chris Evans. It's actually fun seeing Chris Evans play villainous roles, especially since I'm used to seeing him as Captain America. So him doing the 180 and having a blast playing a villain role was actually quite refreshing, and he is the only actor in this movie that stood out to me. That's all I'll say there. He's like the only one who really went above and beyond and gave a memorable performance in this movie. And that's where my issues lie because yeah, you got people like Ryan Gosling and Ana de Armas, even people like Alfred Woodard and uh, Billy Bob Thornton in this movie, but nobody stands out. Like, yeah, I love Ryan Gosling as an actor, but his character is just so dull and uninteresting. Like, he plays such an emotionless character that I felt disconnected from the whole movie. The character did not do anything to stand out from other action protagonists in similar type scenarios. And I felt like this was a case where you could have cast anybody for this role and it'd be the same type of performance. And because, considering I'm a fan of Ryan Gosling in movies like Drive and La La Land and others, this was disappointing considering Ryan Gosling is seen as one of the best actors working today. I didn't feel anything in his performance. And I thought they wasted Ana de Armas' talent in this movie because, yeah, she's a fantastic actress as well, yet the movie does nothing with her. Like, she's just there, I guess, just to add another name to the cast. You could have, like, cut her out of the movie. Aside from one scene where she contributes and helps out her main character, but... Her story just felt like she was in a completely different movie. And I was pretty disappointed with that because of how much I love Anna as an actress, especially in movies like Blade Runner 2049, Knives Out, and her awesome one scene in No Time to Die. She hardly does anything worthwhile in this movie, which I thought was absolutely disappointing. Yeah, the action sequences are well done, but the story is such a mess. Other people have highlighted, it's kind of like a combination of better stories and similar movies of this genre. Like, there's a little bit of John Wick in this movie. There's a little bit of Man on Fire in this movie. There are just so many cliches in the genre where other movies have done it better to the point where The Green Man, it just feels like it's a tired, worn out movie in its genre. 
which is disappointing considering the Russo brothers directed this. And also the execution of the story I thought was very weak. It was so ridiculously convoluted in the way it was structured. And because of the movie's rapid fire pacing and the excessive amount of action sequences, I just felt physically exhausted after watching this movie. Yeah, the action scenes are well done, but because of my little attachment to the characters, the film became another snooze fest, in my opinion. It just baffled me that $200 million was put into this movie. Yeah, it was well spent on the action, but it wasn't well spent on a good quality story. And that's the frustrating thing about The Gray Man. Also, I gotta highlight that they decided to use drone shots several times in this movie. And to me, the drone shots were a mixed bag. Using them for establishing and tracking shots, I was like, okay, that's kind of cool how they're integrated. But then there, there's drone shots used in the middle of some of the action sequences, even during hand-to-hand -hand combats. And when they did that, I thought it was an out-of-place distraction. I was very much questioning why they did that. And that was not a smart decision. And it made the movie feel cheap at times. But that's just my personal opinion. Overall, The Gray Man, there's good stuff visually. It's well made, especially on an action level. And even though Chris Evans is trying and I love his villainous performance, the movie itself is an absolute dud. This is one of the biggest disappointments of 2022 so far. The story just doesn't work well. The Gray Man himself is such a dull character. And I was left physically drained by this movie because of the convoluted structure of this thing. So... It's disappointing to see that the Russo brothers have made a step down in their career, but I hope they can still make good movies in the future. I kind of wish they'd go back and make Marvel movies, that's just me personally, but we'll see what the Russo brothers do going forward. Hopefully they can make better movies than The Gray Man. And as for The Gray Man, I'll be giving the film a 2.5 out of 5 stars, and on the 100 point scale, it's getting a 48 out of 100. So I'm filming this closing part of the video now that it's official that uh, I've seen all the uh, theatrical and streaming movies for July of 2022. I hope you enjoyed this Cinema Roundup video where I shared my initial thoughts on the theatrical and streaming movies that I've watched this past month. Let me know down in the comments below what you thought of the movies that I, that I watched. Uh, Elvis, Lightyear. Thor Love and Thunder, The Sea Beast, and The Gray Man. Share your thoughts in the comments below, whether you loved them, hated them, or were mixed on them. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Click the subscribe button to see more content and the notification bell next to it, so you can be notified of future videos. If this is your first video, I usually do movie reviews, TV reviews, ranking videos, and other fun stuff along the way. I have some more videos planned for you soon. Hope you all have an amazing day. God bless, and I will see you next time. Goodbye!